Torah portion, Ki Tavo, which means when you come in. And it's kind of, you know, the names of the Torah portions aren't inspired or anything, but it's very much the theme of this Torah portion. And it's a theme which is relevant to us because they're being told when you come into the land. So that's kind of what I want to look at in all three parts. Um, it's not going to be a massive Torah portion this week, but it's an interesting one. Deuteronomy 26 starts with, And it shall be when you come into the land which Yahuwah, your Elohim, is giving you as an inheritance and you possess it and dwell in it. And that is something that I think a lot of these things that are said, they would have had no idea when this was going to actually become relevant because it's relevant to us and to the chosen all the way throughout time. These words are written to us when you come into the land, because we're going to go into the land and have his an inheritance. They were given it, and then they messed it up. Yehovah knew that was going to happen, and knew that we were the people who would go in at his coming into the land. That you shall take some of the first of all the fruits of the soil which you bring from your land that Yehovah your Elohim is giving you, and shall put it in a basket and go to the place where Elohim, where Yehovah your Elohim chooses to make his name dwell there. And this idea of making his name dwell there is worthwhile looking at exactly what that is. Is his name still in Jerusalem? Because that was the place that he chose to make his name dwell. Is it still there? How does that stand at the moment? Second Chronicles 6, 5-8 to eight says, From the day that I brought my people out of the land of Mitzrayim, I have chosen no city from any tribe of Israel in which to build a house for my name. Okay, so there's actually a house which is involved here where his name is going to dwell. And we know his name is his character and his reputation is fame. But if this was just talking about, well, in Jerusalem, you know, people should know who I am there and it should reflect who I am or anything like that, then that would be the same for every city in Israel. That's what would be expected for Israelites living anywhere, that they would show his name to people. So it's not that, it's something that's beyond that. To be there, nor did I choose any man to be a leader of my people, Israel. But I've chosen Yerushalayim for my name to be there. And I've chosen David to be over my people, Israel. And it was in the heart of my father, David, to build a house for the name of Yehovah Elohim of Israel. But Yehovah said to my father, David, because it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well in that it was in your heart. And we know what happened here. Okay, this is where the altar was. This is where all the people would bring everything to Jerusalem. This is where all the offerings were made. And this is the element which is beyond what was done in all of their gates. They couldn't make these offerings in all of their gates. It was what was offered to Elohim here. All of the animals that were offered to him. There's something about this which is about his name dwelling there. Second Chronicles 12 verse 13 says, So King Rechavam strengthened himself in Yerushalayim and reigned. For Rechavam was 41 years old when he became king. And he reigned 17 years in Yerushalayim, the city in which Yehovah had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And that's what they're always told, isn't it? When you go up to the place that which I have chosen or which I will choose from all of your tribes. Exodus 20 verse 24 shows us that this, the altar where they would offer these things is linked with his name. It says, make an altar of earth for me and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your cattle in every place where I cause my name to be remembered. So there's something about these offerings which causes his name to be remembered. I shall come to you and bless you. Matthew 23, 34 to 39. I want to just read the first verse of this and we'll come back to it. We'll come to a word that we want to have a look at to understand as we go on. Because of this, see, I send you prophets, wise men, and scholars of scripture. The word is grammateus, okay? And it's commonly translated as scribe. And we kind of think scribes are a bad thing. Okay, it's the scribes and the Pharisees, isn't it? 
That's what everybody has in their head. This word goes back into the New Testament. You know, we find this exact Greek word in the Septuagint, but there's a Hebrew word for it. But notice that he says that he sent these people because what they ended up with was kind of like their own religious system, their own way of doing things. These people were not part of his original plan that he said, I want you to um, have things like this. Okay, I want you to have Shoftim, Shoterim, I want you to have the Levim. Okay, these people were not included and yet they came to be a part of the system in Israel. It says here, clerk, scribe, especially a public servant, secretary, recorder, whose office and influence differed in different states. In the Bible, a man learned in the Mosaic law and the sacred writings, an interpreter, a teacher. Scribes examined the more difficult and subtle questions of the, of the law, added to the Mosaic law, decisions of various kinds, uh, I thought to elucidate its meaning. So there was the best intentions with these people. Okay, and they're the people who, from whom you'll get the fences that were put around Torah. They're not necessarily bad. Okay, Yehovah says, I've sent you these things. Okay, I will use these things at the very least. In 2 Kings 22 verse 3, we see here, Shaphan the scribe, in the 18th year of King Yoshiahu, that's Josiah, that the king sent Shaphan the scribe, son of Atliyahu, son of Meshulam, to the house of Yehovah. Second Samuel, okay, so we're talking about David, David here. We looked at Second Samuel in detail the other week. Now Yoav was over all the army of Israel. Yoav was the guy who was told, treat Absalom gently. And he just said, yeah, whatever. And he stabbed him through the heart when he found him. Three spears. So that's who Yoav is. Over all the army of Israel and Benaiah son of Yehuyada was over the Karathites and the Palathites. And Adoram was over the compulsory labor. Yehoshaphat, son of Achilud, was recorder. Shiva was scribe. Zadok and Aviathor, we saw those, were the priests. And Ira, the Yairite, was priest to David. So he's got like this kind of retinue of people who had their own responsibilities. Notice here, okay, we've got Shiva the scribe. And we've got a recorder, and then we've got these other jobs. So these are kind of like jobs that men have come up with. And we find very much the same situation today. You'll get a lot of people who will say, you know, they'll know a lot about the scriptures and they'll be teaching of the scriptures, but they'll say, I am not a teacher. Okay, it's like these people, they were not Levites, and they were not according to the way that Yehovah had instituted things, but Yehovah did use these things for good. Second Kings 12 verse 10, it came to be whenever they saw that there was much silver in the chest that the king scribe and the high priest came up. These are not things that are commanded by Yehovah, but this is kind of the religious system which they ended up with. It very much reminds me of theologians today. 2 Kings 22, 8-20, And Chukiyahu, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the scribe, I have found the book of the Torah in the house of Yehovah. And Chukiyah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. We're pointing out that he's called Chukiyahu and Chukiyah. Uh, people think that this Yahu has some kind of meaning to it, that it needs to be in Yehovah's name. But it's not the case. You study it out, you'll find that there's lots of examples of this. And Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought word to the king again, saying, Your servants have gathered the silver that was found in the house, and have given it into the hand of those who do the work, and oversee the house of Yehovah. And Shaphan the scribe informed the king, saying, Chukiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Okay, so the king's got a scribe. He's got somebody who's going to relay the Torah to him. What did Yehovah say? He said the king writes out his own copy of the Torah so that he's got it, so he can make judgments from it. We saw that David kind of erred in the judgments that he made according to the Torah. And he had the scribe who would have explain these things and it's, it's kind of like it's a bit like what Yehovah wanted but it's a bit different maybe we'll do it differently maybe we'll have a guy that knows loads about the scriptures and then maybe he can tell the king because he knows more than the king and the king's supposed to read it and to understand it 
And it came to be when the king heard the words of the book of the Torah that he tore his garments. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest and Achikam the son of Shaphan and Achbor son of Mechiah and Shaphan the scribe and Asiyah a servant of the king saying, Go inquire of Yehovah for me, for the people and for all Yehudah concerning the words of this book that has been found. Because what they've found in this book is what we're going to cover in the Torah portion. They've found the blessings and they found the curses. And they've realized we've gone against all of this. These curses are going to come upon us. For great is the wrath of Yehovah that is kindled against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. Then Chukiyahu the priest and Achicham and Achbor and Shaphan and Asiyah went to Chudah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, son of Tikvah. So they need to inquire of Yehovah. They go to someone who is known to be a prophet, son of Chachas, keeper of the wardrobe, whatever that turns out to be. Now she was dwelling in Yerushalayim in the second quarter and they spoke with her. And she said to them, thus said Yehovah Elohim of Israel, say to the man who sent you to me, thus said Yehovah, see I am bringing evil on this place and on its inhabitants all the words of the book which the king of Yehudah has read. Okay, the king of Yehudah, Yoshiahu, he ends up repenting. He turns from this and yet this is still brought on the people of Jerusalem. And Charlie's looked before at this idea of syncretism. The people thought that they were worshipping Yehovah by doing it. We're going to see just how bad their religious system had become. It's not just these recorders and scribes which you could look at and say, well, maybe that was them trying to do something good that wasn't uh, forbidden by the Torah. But the things that they actually did in their worship were forbidden by the Torah. But they would have all thought that they were worshipping Yehovah. And yet, what does Yehovah say? He doesn't say, oh, they didn't know, they didn't know any better. It's fine. You know, just as long as they stop, it's fine. No, he's angry with these people for it. They had all of these recorders, these scribes, and they could have found out from the scriptures um, what he actually required, but they didn't. They just... To me, it seems like they were comfortable with their religious system and they kind of built it all just a little bit differently. Because they've forsaken me and burned incense to other gods to provoke me with all the work of their hands. And so my wrath shall be kindled against this place and not be quenched. And to the king of Yehudah who sent you to inquire of Yehovah, say this to him. Thus said Yehovah Elohim of Yisrael, as for the words which you have heard, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before Yehovah, when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they will become a ruin and a curse and did tore your garments and wept before me, I also have heard. So when you shemad what I spoke against this place, when you heard it, I also have heard because of this. Therefore, see, I'm gathering you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, so that your eyes do not see all the evil I'm bringing on this place. And they brought word to the king. We've got some good news and some bad news. What's the bad news? Um, Yehovah said he is going to go through with all the curses, and this entire place is going to be destroyed. Ah, okay, what's the good news? Good news is, you're going to die. Oh. The righteous one has perished, and no one takes it to heart. Kind men are taken away, while no one understands that the righteous one is taken away from the presence of evil. He enters into peace. They who walk in integrity rest on their beds. Okay, so this is where Yehovah is coming from. Second Kings continues and says, And the king sent, and they gathered all the elders of Yehudah and Yerushalayim to him. And the king went up to the house of Yehovah with all the men of Yehudah and all the inhabitants of Yerushalayim with him, and the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And he read in, the hearing all the, in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the house of Yehovah. And the king stood by the column, and made the covenant before Yehovah to follow Yehovah and to cherish his commands and his witnesses and his laws with all his heart and all his soul. To establish the words of his co this covenant that were written in this book 
and all the people stood to the covenant. Then the king commanded Chukiyahu, the high priest, and the priests of the second order, and the doorkeepers, whoever these people are, okay, no, none of these things are asked for in the Torah, to bring out of the temple of Yehovah all the objects that were made for Baal and for Asherah and for all the hosts of the heavens. And he burned them outside Yerushalayim in the fields of Kidron and took their ashes to Bethel. And he put down the black-robed priests whom, whom the kings of Yehudah had appointed to burn incense on the high places in the cities of Yehudah and in the places all around Yerushalayim. And those who burned incense to Baal, to the sun and to the moon, to the constellations and to all the host of the heavens. And these are the things that we see today, aren't they? Okay, everything's just very slightly different. It's not quite the way Yehovah has asked for it to be. And then we've got these people trying to uh, worship Yehovah in whatever way they are. A bit of paganism, we'll mix in a bit of paganism, but you know, it doesn't matter. You know, we know where their hearts are at. Oh, Yehovah is capable of pulling the people that he wants, pulling the remnants out of these systems. We're not to look at these systems and say, it's okay though, Th those people will be fine. No, Yehovah is angry with these people. He brought out the Asherah from the house of Yehovah to the Wadi Kedron outside Jerusalem and burned it at the Wadi Kedron, ground it to ashes and threw its ashes on the graves of the sons of the people. And he broke down the houses of the male cult prostitutes that were in the house of Yehovah and the women wove tapestries for the Asherah. When I went to the British Museum, one of the things that really stood out to me is as you looked at all of the different cultures, you looked at the artwork of all the different cultures, they all had all of these exact same things going on, all of these perversions. And you can see that they were all kind of like spiritualized and the people thought that they were good for different, different reasons. I saw it in uh, the New Age as well, the idea of you know uh, polygamy being like the, the ultimate thing that you want to go for and not, not having one wife, all, all of this stuff. And you can see all the perversions and how they were kind of like held up. And I can imagine that these people thought that this was part of spirituality. They thought that it was part of uh, worshiping Yahuwah. He brought all the priests from the cities of Yahudah defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense from Gevah to Be'er Shavah broke down the high places at the gates which were at the entrance to the gates of Yeshi, uh, Yehoshua, the governor of the city, um, which were to the left of the city gate. Okay, so now what we're going to see is these priests that have been involved in this, they're all going to be uh, used to defile these places. However, the priests of the high places did not come up to the altar of Yehovah in Yerushalayim. They ate unleavened bread among their brothers. Okay, so where are you supposed to do it? You're supposed to come up for the Feast of Unleavened Bread at Jerusalem. They didn't. They ate unleavened bread, but they did it somewhere else. That's what they desired in their hearts. And he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Well, worth mentioning at this point, Gebene Hinnom in Hebrew, the valley of the son of Hinnom, later shortened to the valley of Hinnom, which is uh, Gay Hinnom in the Septuagint, that is Gehenna, okay? It's the same place that Yeshua is talking about um, as kind of like an analogy for the place where you go to be burnt up. So that no man could make his son or daughter pass through the fire to Malach. And he did away with the horses that the kings of Yehudah had given to the son. At the entrance to the house of Yehovah by the room of Nathan Malach, the eunuch, that were in the court, and he burned the chariots of the sun with fire. And the altars that were on the roof of the upper room of Achaz, which the kings of Yehudah have made, and the altars which Manasseh have made in the two courtyards of the house of Yehovah. So he's the king that came right before. That's why Yehovah is so incensed, uh, because of all the things that Manasseh did. And the king broke down and rushed from there and threw their dust into the Wadi Kedron. And the king defiled the high places that were before Yerushalayim, which were on the right hand of the mountain of destruction, which Shlomo, king of Yisrael, had built for Ashtoreth, the abomination of the Sidonians, and for Kamosh, the abomination of the Moabites, and for Milcom, the abomination of the children of Amom. 
and he broke in pieces the pillars. He cut down the Asherim and he filled their places with the bones of men. And also the altar that was at Beth El, the high place which Yeruvam, son of Nevat, made, which, uh, by which he made Yisrael sin. Both that altar and the high place he broke down. And he burned the high place and ground it to dust and burned the Asherah. Then Yoshua, who turned, he saw the tombs that were there on the mountain, and he sent and took the bones out of the tombs and burned them on the altar and defiled it, according to the word of Yehovah, which the man of Elohim proclaimed, who proclaimed these words. So this is all this kind of culmination of all of these things that we've seen uh, leading up to this point in Scripture kind of ten, tend to read over things like this, the bit which the man of Elohim proclaimed. Okay, if we go all the way back to 1 Kings 13, it says, And see, a man of Elohim went from Yehudah to Beth El by the word of Yehovah, while Yehovah was standing by the altar to burn incense. And he cried out against the altar by the word of Yehovah and said, O altar, altar, thus said Yehovah, see, a son is to be born to the house of David, Yoshiah, who is his name, and on you he shall offer the priests of the high places who burn incense on you, and men's bones be burned on you. Okay, so this is where that comes from. And this is, as I say, very much the culmination of a, a lot of the stuff which has uh, happened up until this point. When it says, like, this person, son of Nevat, built this. We see those things in scripture. And he said, what tombstone is this that I see? And the men of the city said to him, it is the tomb of the man of Elohim who came from Yehudah and proclaimed these matters. You know, the guy that got killed by the lion. Um, he was told, don't go and eat. And you went and eat and got killed by the lion, which you have done against the altar of Beth El. And he said, let him alone. Let no one move his bones. So they left his bones alone with the bones of the prophet who came from Shomeron. And Yoshiah, who also took away all the houses of the high places that were in the cities of Shomeron, which the kings of Israel had made to provoke. And he did to them according to the deeds he did in Beth El. And he slaughtered all the priests of the high places who were there on the altars and burned men's bones on them and went back to Jerusalem. So this place is the place where Yehovah has chosen for his name to dwell. And this is what they've turned it into. This is the religious system they've turned this into. And the king commanded all the people saying, prepare the Passover to Yehovah your Elohim as it is written in this book of the covenant. For such a Passover has not been prepared since the days of the rulers, the Shoftim, the judges, those in the book of Judges, who ruled Israel, nor in all the days of the kings of Israel and the kings of Yehudah. So they'd not even been doing Passover for all, that, all the days of the kings. That includes King David. They'd not done Passover since the days of the judges. But in the 18th year of King Yoshiahu, this Passover was prepared before Yehovah in Yerushalayim. And also Yoshiahu put away those who consulted mediums and spiritists and household gods and idols and all the abominations that were seen in the land of Yehudah and in Yerushalayim in order to establish the words of the Torah, which were written in the book that Hilkiahu, the priest, found in the house of Yehovah. And before him there was no king like him who turned back to Yehovah with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his might, according to all the Torah of Moshe, and after him none rose up like him. However, Yehovah did not turn from the fierceness of his great wrath, with which his wrath burned against Yehudah, because of all the provocations with which Manasseh had provoked him. And Yehovah said, Even Yehudah, Judah, the place, I shall remove from my presence as I have removed Israel, and I shall reject this city, Yerushalayim, which is there, which I have chosen, and the house of which I said, my name is there. So this comes right to this point. Okay, he says, I've chosen this place for my name to dwell there. This is talking about the house of Judah, actually, talking about Judah in another part. He says, I've chosen this place, this is where my name shall dwell, but it comes to this point where they have um, where they've rejected his instructions, I guess, and he says, I reject this city, Yerushalayim, of which I have chosen, and the house where I said my name is there. And it's not actually clear from this point 
whether his name ever comes back to dwell in Jerusalem. It could be, it could well be the, um, the case, but the scripture never tells us that he chooses Jerusalem again for his name. If he did, I would suggest that at this point, he rejects it again. Because of this, see, I send you prophets and wise men and scholars of scripture. Some of them you shall kill and crucify. Some of them you shall flog in your congregations and persecute from city to city. So that on you should come all the righteous blood shed on the earth. From the blood of righteous Havel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Bechiah, whom you murdered between the dwelling place and the altar of Chigeno. Uh, connected with his name. Truly I say to you, all this shall come upon this generation. Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim, killing the prophets and stoning those who were sent to her. How often I wish to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, but you would not. See, your house is left to you laid waste or desolate. For I say to you, from now on you shall by no means see me until you say, blessed is he who is coming in the name of Yehovah. And when they say that, okay, when we say that, whoever it is, then his name will return to be there and he will again choose Jerusalem, he tells us, okay? When it says, blessed is he who is coming in the name of Yehovah, it's not talking about when they say, blessed is the Messiah or blessed is Yeshua. He's saying, look, I sent to you these people who all came in my name and you rejected them and you murdered them and you killed them until you recognize that it's good for these people to come. Even if they're telling you things that you don't want to hear and you say, blessed is he who is coming in his name, you will not see me and my name will not return here. Jeremiah 32, 39 to 42 says, For the children of Israel and the children of Yehudah have done only evil before me from their youth. For the children of Israel have only provoked me with the work of their hands, declares Yehovah. For this city has been a cause for my displeasure and my wrath from the day that they built it even to this day that I should remove it from before my face. Because of all the evil of the children of Israel and the children of Yehudah, which they have done to provoke me, they, their kings, their heads, their priests, their prophets, and the men of Yehuda, and the inhabitants of Yerushalayim, and they have turned their back to me and not their face. Though I taught them rising up early and teaching them, they did not listen to receive instruction. And they set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name, to defile it. And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to offer up their sons and daughters to Melech, which I did not command them. Nor did it come into my heart that they should do this abomination to make Yehudah sin. And now thus said Yehovah, the Elohim of Israel, concerning this city of which you shall say, it shall be given into the hand of the king of Babel by the sword and by scarcity and food and by pestilence. Guest of food. See, I'm gathering them out of all the lands where I've driven them in my displeasure and in my wrath and in great rage, and I shall bring them back to this place and shall let them dwell in safety. You see, when Yehovah speaks of his people, he speaks sometimes of the people then, but he's speaking of the people in the future. Okay, he's saying, look, all these curses are going to come upon you, but I will bring you back. He's speaking of his people. Uh, as a whole. So all of these things are going to come on those people. But we will come back. The chosen will come back to dwell in the land. And they shall be my people. And I shall be their Elohim. And this is kind of this idea of when you come into the land. That we're going to see as a thread which runs throughout this entire thing. Those things were promised to them. Um, the blessings are promised to us. And I shall give them one heart and one way to fear me all the days for the good of them and of their children after them. So these are the things which we're seeing being fulfilled now. And I shall make an everlasting covenant with them that I do not turn back from doing good to them. And I shall put my fear in their heart so as not to turn aside from me. And I shall rejoice over them to do them good and shall plant them in this land in truth with all my heart and with all my soul. So just as he's saying these things, 
I don't know how the people then would have taken it. Like, well, are we going to be thrown out the land and then we're going to come back? And he's speaking to, to them and saying, when you come into the land and you've done all of these things, and they're thinking, well, that must be us. We're going to go into the land and we're going to do all of these things. And then this is going to be true of us. And then Yehovah is going to say that he's our Elohim. I don't think they realized just how long, how far off these things were. For thus said Yehovah, as I brought all this great evil on this people, so I am bringing on them all the good that I am speaking to them. As I brought evil on this people, I'm bringing on them all the good that I've spoken. So what we're going to see as we go through the rest of the Torah portion of the curses and the blessings. Zechariah 2, 10 to 13, Yehovah says, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Siom, for look, I am coming and shall dwell in your midst, declares Yehovah. Many Gentiles shall be joined to Yehovah in that day, and they shall become my people, and I shall dwell in your midst. And we're going to look at this idea of becoming his people. Is that just something that you say, or is it something that you, you do? And you shall know that Yehovah has ever owed to sent me to you. And Yehovah shall inherit Yehudah, okay, his portion in the set apart land. And he shall again choose Yerushalayim. Hush all flesh before Yehovah, for he's roused himself out of his set apart dwelling. So he's rejected Yerushalayim. But there will come a time when he chooses it for his name to dwell there again. And it shall be when you come into the land which Yehovah your Elohim is giving you as an inheritance and you possess it and dwell in it that you shall take some of the first of all the fruits of the soil which you bring from your land that Yehovah your Elohim is giving you. And you shall put it in a basket and go to the place where Yehovah your Elohim chooses to make his name dwell there. Okay, This was said to them but I believe that this is something that we will do in the future. You shall come to the one who is priest in those days and say to him, I shall declare today to Yehovah your Elohim that I have come to the land which Yehovah swore to our fathers to give us. And the priest shall take the basket from your hand and place it before the altar of Yehovah your Elohim. When we're reading these things, of course we need to remember that we were once Gentiles in the flesh who were called the uncircumcision, by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands. That at that time, we were without Messiah and we were excluded from the citizenship of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no expectation and without Elohim in the world. But now in Messiah Yeshua, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Mashiach. Okay, so now we're part of Israel and we're no longer strangers from these promises. All of these promises that we see in the Torah portions today apply to us. They're things that we are going to inherit when you come into the land to inherit these things. You shall answer and say before Yehovah your Elohim, my father was a perishing Aramean. He went down to Mitraim and sojourned there with a few men. And there he became a great nation, great, mighty, and numerous. But, let the, Mit but the Mitrites did evil to us and afflicted us and imposed hard labor on us. Then we cried out to Yehovah Elohim of our fathers. Yehovah heard our voice and saw our affliction and our toil and our oppression. And Yehovah brought us out of Mitraim with a strong hand, with an outstretched arm, with great fear, and with signs and wonders. So how are these words relevant for us? How are we to understand them? You can say, and you shall say before Yehovah your Elohim, my father was a perishing soul, sojourning in the world with his family, an alien to your great promises to your people. And the world yielded evil and affliction to us, and we became slaves of sin there. Then we cried out to Yehovah Elohim of our spiritual forefathers, and Yehovah listened to our voice, saw our affliction, and our toil and our oppression. And Yehovah brought us out of the world through Yeshua's strong hand, with his outstretched arm, with great power and compassion and kindness. And he brought us to a place and has given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. 
And now, see, I have brought the first fruit to the land which you, O Yehovah, have given me. Then you shall place it before Yehovah your Elohim. Bow down before Yehovah your Elohim. And shall rejoice in all the good which Yehovah your Elohim has given to you, your house, you and the Levite and the stranger who is among you. And we can say, he has promised to bring us to his land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now see, I have brought the first fruits of the portion which you, O Yehovah, have given me. And you shall place it before Yehovah your Elohim and bow down before Yehovah your Elohim and shall rejoice in all the good which Yehovah your Elohim has given to you and your house, you and the people whom Yehovah cares for around you. When you've completed tithing in the tithe of your increase in the third year, which is the year of tithing, and have given it to the Levite, to the strangers, to the fatherless, and to the widow, and they've eaten within your gates and have been satisfied, then you shall say before Yehovah your Elohim, I have put away the set apart portion from my house, and also have given it to the Levite, to the stranger, to the fatherless, and to the widow, according to all your command which you have commanded me. I have not transgressed your commands, nor have I forgotten. I have not eaten any of it when in mourning, nor have I removed any of it for any unclean use, nor given any of it for the dead. I have obeyed the voice of Yehovah my Elohim. I have done according to all that you have commanded me. Look from your set apart dwelling place from the heavens. Bless your people, Yisrael, and the land which you've given us, as you swore to our fathers, a land flowing with milk and honey. And this is what they're being told. When you've said these things, then you will Proclaim to be the people of Yehovah and you'll cause him to be your Elohim. And we can say, when you've completed tithing or the tithe of your increase in the third year, which is the year of tithing, have given it to the teachers scattered throughout Israel, to the strangers, to the fatherless, to the widow, and they have eaten and have been satisfied. Then you shall say before Yehovah your Elohim, I've put apart the set and put away the set apart portion from my house, and also have given it to the teachers scattered throughout Israel, and to the stranger, and to the fatherless, and to the widow, according to all that you have commanded me. I have not transgressed your commands, nor have I forgotten. I have not eaten any of it when in mourning, nor have I removed any of it for any unclean use. I'm going to look at that in the second part, nor used any for what seemed right in my own eyes. I have obeyed the voice of Yehovah my Elohim. I have done according to all that you've commanded me. Look from your set apart dwelling place from the heavens and bless your people, Israel, and the portion which you've given us and bring us into your land, a land flowing with milk and honey. See, we can understand the words in Scripture and we can either say, well, these things don't relate to me or we can look like Charlie did last week at how uh, the principles relate to us. But I firmly believe that when we enter into the land, we will be required to come before the priest, give the first fruit to the land and to say, those words. As as we've seen, they really didn't do a whole lot of what they were told to do. We will be the first people to go into the land and do it. They didn't keep the Sabbaths in the land. They didn't do a whole load of things. They didn't keep Passover past the periods of the judges. We will be the first people to, uh, to do all of these things. Be on guard lest you forget Yehovah your Elohim by not guarding his commands. I think it's striking the stuff that's in this. Okay, if you read the words as they're presented, it's, it's all said in a way to remind you that Yehovah is behind all these things. They were told when you, become, when you have all of this abundance, don't forget Yehovah your Elohim. But in these things which we are to say to him, when we enter the land, or as we can understand them now, there's the remembrance in them that he is the, he's the source of um, everything. Today, Yehovah your Elohim is commanding you to do these laws and justices, and you shall cherish and do them with all your heart and with all your soul. You have today caused Yehovah to proclaim to be your Elohim and to walk in his ways, cherish his laws and his commands and his justices, and to obey his voice. We make him proclaim to be our Elohim. We've got that set of instructions there. You follow those things. And in that day, you have caused Yehovah to proclaim to be your Elohim. You don't say, Yehovah is my Elohim. You do the things, and then he proclaims to be your Elohim. 
If Elohim, desiring to show wrath and to make his power known, with much patience tolerated the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, including all the people that were told when you come into the land, they might make known the riches of his esteem on vessels of compassion which he had prepared beforehand for esteem, even whom he called, not only us of the Yahudim, but also of the Gentiles. As he says in Hosea 2, I shall call them my people who were not my people, and her beloved who is not beloved. Call his name low on me, for you are not my people, and I am not for you, is what it says in the Masoretic text. The Septuagint is very slightly different. Not my people, for you are not my people, and I am not your God. You do these things, you will cause him to proclaim to be your Elohim. And it shall be in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people. There they shall be called sons of the living Elohim. And Yeshiah who cries on behalf of Israel through the number of the, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant shall be saved. Therefore, see, I am alluring her and shall lead her into the wilderness and shall speak to her heart. Okay, who are the remnant? Who are the ones who, that are going to go into the land that he is going to proclaim to be their Elohim? They're the ones that he can allure. He's going to speak to their hearts. They're going to be allured by him. They're going to love him. And give, give to her vineyards from there. And the valley of Achor is a door of expectation. And there she shall respond as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up, from the land of Mitzrayim. And it shall be in that day, declares Jehovah, that you call me my husband and no longer call me my Baal. And I shall remove the names of the Baals from her mouth and they shall no more be remembered by their name. And in that day, I shall make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and with the birds of the heavens and with the creeping creatures of the ground. Um, when, I, when the bow and sword and battle I break from the earth, and I shall make them lie down in safety. And I shall take you as a bride unto me forever. And take you as a bride unto me in righteousness and in justice and kindness and compassion. And I shall take you as a bride unto me in trustworthiness. And you shall know, Yehovah. And it shall be in that day that I answer, declares Yehovah. That I answer the heavens and they answer the earth. And the earth answered the grain and the new wine and the oil. And they answer Jezreel. And I shall sow her for myself in the earth, and I shall have compassion on her who had not obtained compassion. And I shall say to those who were not my people, you are my people, while they say, my Elohim, the ones who are a Lord. So all of the words of this Torah portion which are spoken to these people, we can't forget that when Yehovah speaks to his people and says, look, I'm going to bring this upon you and then I'm going to heal you. Afterwards, the ones that he's going to heal are us, the ones who are responding to his word, the ones who are being healed, the ones who he has given a new heart to. We'll come back in the second part and continue this theme as it goes through. Okay, so now it is first day or Sunday. I've come back the next day uh, to record part two and part three. Uh, the bulb on the projector went the lamp unit so i've just ordered the new one it'll be here for next week um, but i'll record these parts now now i'm gonna have to switch between i'll advance the slides with this on the computer that's going into the output to the internet i've also got a laptop here so i'll have to go forward on this and try to keep in sync um, on the presentations as we go now we saw in the first part that by doing those things essentially by doing all the things that Yehovah asks by actually being his people by actually making him our Elohim we have caused Yehovah to proclaim to be our Elohim verse 18 of Deuteronomy 26 says and Yehovah has caused you to proclaim today to be his people so he's caused us to proclaim to be his people. We can proclaim, we can make the proclamation that we are his people. However, it's not until we do the things he asks of us that we are actually proclaiming by our actions to be 
his people. So he doesn't care what he, what we say with our mouths. He cares what it is that we do. A treasured possession. By doing those things, we become a treasured possession on the earth to him. We're set apart for a praise, a name, and esteem to Yehovah. As he has spoken to you, and to cherish all of his commands. Verse 19 says, So as to set you high above all nations which he's made, for a praise, for a name, for esteem, for you to be a set apart people to Yehovah your Elohim, as he has spoken. And as I said in the first part, these people were supposed to be in this position. They were supposed to take hold of this. They were told, you've got this opportunity now. Got the opportunity to make Yehovah to proclaim to be your Elohim, to be set apart to him. They didn't take hold of it though. We have that opportunity now, that same opportunity to make, uh, to be a name and a praise and an esteem to Yehovah. And we saw in Deuteronomy 4 really what this is talking about. Deuteronomy 4, 5 to 8 says, See, I have taught you laws and justice, as Yehovah my Elohim commanded me to do thus in the land which you go to possess. And you shall cherish and do them, and this is your wisdom and your understanding before the eyes of the peoples who hear all these laws, and they shall say, Only a wise and understanding people is this great nation. But why? Why do they see us as wise and understanding? Do they look at us and think, Wow, those people are great. They're so clever. No, of course not. It's the laws, the justices, the uh, chukah, and the uh, the mishpatim um, that Yehovah gives to us. Verse 7 says, For what great nation is there which has Elohim so near to it as Yehovah our Elohim is to us whenever we call on him? So we call on his name. We walk in his name and we become to him in the earth a name and a praise and an esteem and a set apart people to him. Verse 8 says, And what great nation is there that has such laws and righteous justices like all these Torah which I set before you today? Okay, all of the Torah, Torah being the, the plural for the Torah. All of these things which have been set before you. But it's by doing these things that we become a name to Yehovah. Because people look upon his people. They look upon his teachings. They see the actual fruit of that. People doing those things who are actually proclaiming to be his people. Rather than saying that they're his people. Whilst proclaiming by their actions uh, to have rejected his teachings. Matthew 5:13 to 16 says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt becomes tasteless, how shall it be seasoned? For it is no longer of any use but to be thrown out and to be trodden down by men. So if we uh, no longer walk in his statutes, we no longer take the thing which makes us the salt, which doesn't come from us, it comes from our obedience to what he says to do, then it's no longer of use to anybody. We're certainly not a name or a praise or an esteem to Yehovah. It's no use to anyone but to be thrown out, to be trodden down by men. You are the light of the world, and it is impossible for a city to be hidden on a mountain. Okay, it's impossible if we actually proclaim to be his people. It's certainly possible that we will not stand out, that we will not be seasoned to the world if we don't proclaim to be his people and we only say the words, but we don't do what he says we need to be doing to proclaim to be his people. Verse 15 says, Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it shines to all those in the house. We can't help but shine to all of those in the, in the house if we proclaim to be his people, if we're a praise and esteem and a name to him. Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and praise your Father who is in the heavens. So that's how it works. We proclaim to be his people. We are his people on the earth and we become a name a praise and an esteem to him they see our good works and then they praise Yehovah who is in the heavens 
Exodus 6, 6 to 9 says, Say therefore to the children of Yisrael, I am Yehovah, and I shall bring you out from under the burdens of the Mitzrites, and shall deliver you from their enslaving, and shall redeem you with an outstretched arm and great judgments. And I shall take you as my people. Okay, you proclaim to be my people, I will proclaim to be your Elohim, and I shall be your Elohim. And you shall know that I am Yehovah, your Elohim, who is bringing you out from under the burdens of the Mitzrites. And as we saw in the first part, of course, this is a, um, a picture, idiomatic language for us being brought out from under bondage to sin. That's how it's relevant in our lives. To them, it had very real relevance, but they didn't take hold of these promises. And I shall bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, to Yitzchak, and to Yaakov, to give it to you as an inheritance. I am Yehovah, and we are the ones who will take hold of that inheritance. And Moshe spoke thus to the children of Israel. Now, this is important. They didn't listen to Moshe because of shortness of spirit and from hard slavery. Remember what these things are a picture of in our lives. Okay, the hard slavery is being in bondage to sin. So they didn't listen to Moshe, just as people today don't listen to Moshe because of shortness of spirit and from being in bondage to sin. Okay, they put Moshe off. They ignore Moshe. And they say, yeah, okay, maybe if we... We didn't have all this going on in our lives. We'd be able to follow these things. But because of the bondage that they're in to sin, they do not listen to Moshe. And remember what happened to these people. They didn't make it. Just because these things are being spoken to them and they've got the opportunity of taking hold of the promise doesn't mean anything. Just as it doesn't mean anything for us that these things are spoken to us and we have the opportunity to take hold of the promise. Many are called, but few are chosen. Now, with this, with this idea of because of shortness of spirit, we get this idea of because of emotion, and people not following the word because of emotion. Now, as we saw in the first part, when it was talking about, I have not used any of the tithe when in mourning, nor given any of it for the dead. We can see that these things are not an excuse. And I've seen this happen time and again, especially when people are grieving, when people have lost somebody. And it usually centers around addiction, problems with addiction, where people will say, you know, okay, I can kind of keep off whatever this is, like kind of what Charlie calls white knuckle sobriety, Okay, where you, you're right on the edge of, of doing it or not doing it, rather than having submitted. But people are tested in these things. When uh, grief comes upon them, do they just then use it as an excuse to go out and do whatever it is it's in their hearts to do? Have we moved past these things or are we waiting for an excuse that makes it justifiable? Really, are we looking to men around us to say, well, at what point is it justifiable in the eyes of other people for me to do this? No one's going to give me a hard time. I've just lost my dad. I've just lost my mum. Of course, nobody's going to say anything to me. Forgetting, of course, the reason that we should be doing it because we're in submission to Elohim. Leviticus 10, 1 to 9 says, And Nadav and Abihu, the sons of Aharon, each took his fire holder and put fire in it and put incense on it and brought strange fire before Yehovah, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from Yehovah and consumed them, and they died before Yehovah. And Moshe said to Aharon, this is what Yehovah spoke, saying, By those who come near me, let me be set apart. And by um, before all the people, let me be esteemed. And Aharon was silent. So Moshe says, look, this is what Yehovah is talking about. He's saying, those people who come before me, they should kadash me. They should set me apart. I should be made holy by them. And your sons did not do this. These are Aharon's sons. And he's just seen them die. And he remained silent. And Moshe said to Mishael 
and Elzaphan, the sons of Utziel, the uncle of Aharon, and said to them, Come near, take your brothers from before the set apart place out of the camp. So he says to Aharon's nephews, You go in and you take them. So they came near and took them by their long shirts out of the camp, as Moshe had said. And Moshe said to Aharon and to Eletzar and to Ithamar his sons, Do not unbind your heads nor tear your garments lest you die. Okay, what were Adam and Eve told? They were told, you do not eat the fruit of this tree lest you die. You will certainly die in the day that you do. And it's the same for us with Torah. And we know that we have been redeemed from under the power of death. But we can just just as easily put ourselves right back under it by um, doing willful sin. Okay, and these people are told... Don't do any of these things. Because if you do, then you will die. You know, they were close to uh, Yehovah in proximity, which would have been an immediate death. But we can see these things talking about us with spiritual death also. And wrath come upon all the people, but let your brothers, all the house of Yisrael, bewail the burning which Yehovah has kindled. So to Aharon, who's just lost his sons, and to uh, the brothers of the, the men who died, he says no. You have to continue and, and do this. Do not go out from the door of the tent of meeting, lest you die. For the anointing oil of Yehovah is upon you. And they did according to the word of Moshe. So these people, they were in the situation where most people would think, well, you know, I'm grieving. Nobody's going to give me a hard time. If I don't do this, if I don't listen to the words of Moshe, in this circumstance, it's probably going to be okay. You know, oh, of course, of course, this is a situation in which I can get away with doing these things. But Yehovah sees our hearts, of course. And Yehovah spoke to Aharon, saying, Do not drink wine or strong drink, you nor your sons with you, when you go into the tent of meeting, lest you die, a law forever throughout your generations. Okay? You've got something that you need to be doing. Don't think that you can do this. Don't think you're going to be going to have a drink to mourn the loss of your sons. You may not do this. He specifically addresses drinking at this point, which I find interesting. Deuteronomy 16:14, which we looked at before. I've not eaten any of it when in mourning. Okay, so the tithe is Yehovah's set apart portion. We take what he gives to us and then we set some of it apart for his use and we do with it what he has asked us to do and we saw those things in the first part here this kind of this aspect of uh, being human is addressed okay now i've not eaten any of it when in mourning because at that time a time of grief it might seem seem to you might seem to people around you justifiable to step outside of the torah to step outside of the word of elohim but really what it betrays is that we've been waiting for that opportunity where that's really what we want to do. And now there's a situation in which we can feel justified in doing it. So we all need to ask ourselves, is there anything, any point at which we would feel justified in doing sin? Nor have I removed any of it for any unclean use, nor given any of it for the dead. That seemed like perhaps a thing that you could do with it. People uh, often will say things like, oh yeah, you know, you can, you can use the tie for this, you can use the tie for that. What, you want to buy a Bible? Yeah, you know, it's Yehovah's portion, isn't it? Of course he wants you to have a Bible. Of course this, of course that. And there's all these justifications around it when it's actually very easy for us to read the word and say, well, what does he actually want me to do with it? Okay, you wanted it given to the, the Levites. Who are they? They were the teachers of the law, the people who would interpret the law to the rest of Israel. The people who would teach Israel how to be blessed. Then when Israel was blessed, they would receive blessing in return. That's how the, that's how the system worked. But people will feel justified stepping outside of that. And as long as it's something to do with Yehovah or, you know, what, whatever it is, they forget to look at um, what Yehovah asks inside of his word and kind of extend it 
to other things that they want to spend it on. But for the dead, when in mourning, okay, you're going to be in grief, but it's still not acceptable at that point. I have obeyed the voice of Yehovah my Elohim. I have done according to all that you have commanded me. And this is what comes directly before, and you have uh, caused Yehovah to proclaim to be your Elohim, and you have proclaimed to be the people of Elohim. Jeremiah seven twenty one to 28 says, Thus said Yehovah Zevaot, the Elohim of Israel, add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat meat. For I did not speak to your fathers or command them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Mitzrayim about matters of burnt offerings or sacrifices. Well, of course, he, he spoke to them about that, but we're going to go on to understand what he means. He says, but this word I did command them, saying, Obey my voice, and I shall be your Elohim, and you be my people. You want me to proclaim to be your Elohim? You want to proclaim to be my people? Obey my voice. Walk in the ways that I have commanded you, so that it will be well with you. So he's saying, look, it wasn't about the burnt offerings. It wasn't about the sacrifices. It wasn't about wearing ZT. It wasn't about giving tithes. It wasn't about any particular part of the law that you want to look at and say, we're Elohim's people because we keep his feasts. All the Christians, they don't keep his feasts, but we keep his feasts. We're Elohim's people. Elohim says, no, it's not about that. I didn't speak to you about those things. That wasn't what I was trying to address with you. All I said to you is obey my voice. And then afterwards, he says, come up to the top of the mountain and I'll tell you the things that I want them to obey me in. But the, the core principle was obey my voice and then you will be my people. Then I will be your Elohim. But they did not obey or incline their ear, but walked in the counsels in the stubbornness of their evil heart and went backward and not forward. From the day that your fathers came out of the land of Mitzrayim until this day, I have even sent to you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising up early and sending them. So he's saying, look, this is what I wanted of you. Right from the beginning, I said, obey my voice. I'll be your Elohim, you'll be my people. And then I sent the prophets to you. After you refused to, I sent men to you to say, we just need to return to doing this. But they did not obey me or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck. They did more evil than their fathers. And you shall speak all these words to them, though they do not listen to you. And you shall also call to them, though they do, do not answer you. And it's very interesting to me, especially in the position that I'm in, speaking Yehovah's words to people and trying to get them to return to following them, that Yehovah says, Go and speak these words to them, but they will not listen to you. If you read, the, read chapter 3 of Ezekiel, you'll see exactly the same thing. He says, go and speak to them. They won't listen to you because they're stubborn. But go and speak to them anyway. And it would seem to me, I don't profess to know what Yehovah is thinking at any point throughout his word, but the pattern that I see throughout his word is that he wants people to be accountable. He wants them to have been told so that they can have rejected him. They need to have that opportunity to reject him. They hear who he is, they don't like it, they reject it, and then they've been told, this is who he is, they've rejected him, they don't love him, and they don't walk in his ways. But you shall say to them, this is a nation that did not obey the voice of Yehovah the Elohim, nor did they accept instruction. Truth has perished and has been cut off from their mouth. Jeremiah thirty twelve to 22 says, For thus said Yehovah, your breach is incurable. Your wound is grievous. Okay, it's incurable. So when he speaks to the people, as I mentioned in the first part, he speaks to the people in the past, as if they were the people in the future. Because to Yehovah, he's moving towards a very definite goal, and he can see those people at the end, right from the beginning, and that's who he's really speaking to. But he says to these people, who were a part of Israel, he says, your breach is incurable. With some people, there's nothing you can do. You can speak the truth to them as much as you want. And Yehovah wants the truth to be spoken to them, as we've seen once, twice and if they reject it 
They go after false doctrine, then leave them to it. But he says, your breach is incurable, your wound is grievous. No one pleads your cause to bind up. There are no healing medicines for you. And sometimes that's just the way that it is. There's nothing he can do, there's nothing he can say. Because what Yehovah wants is somebody who loves him. Somebody who will be a Lord. Somebody whose heart he can speak to and allure. But for the others, there's no healing medicines for you. There's nothing further that Yehovah could do for these people. There's nothing that we can do for them, certainly, in that situation. All those loving you have forgotten you. They do not seek you. For I smote you as an enemy smites with cruel chastisement, because your crookedness is great, your sins have increased. So he speaks, doesn't he, of the other nations, of the foreign gods, as their lovers that they went after. And he says, they're not interested in you anymore. When you were great, when you were a nation with abundance, of course they wanted to come and commit fornication with you. But now, nobody is seeking after you, because I've smitten you. And what are you now? All that you had came from me. Why do you cry about your breach? Your pain is incurable because of your many crookednesses, because your sins have increased. I have done this to you. However, all those who devour you shall be devoured. And we see this throughout his word. He will use wicked men to punish his people in their wickedness. But he's not happy at that. It, he, you know, he doesn't look at that act and say, that's a righteous thing that you've done well done, like the prophets all being burned or uh, the priests sorry, all being burned or whatever, but he brings upon people punishment by the hands of others. And then he says, and I'll, then I'll deal with them appropriately if they've committed sin, I do, I'll deal with them. He says that he brings foreign kings on the nation of Israel. And we see it throughout, um, throughout scripture. We see him bring uh, a foreign king to judge his nation, and then he judges the um, the nation that was bringing the judgment. All your adversaries, every one of them, shall go into captivity, and those who exploit you shall be exploited, and all who prey on you, I shall make a prey. For I restore health to you and heal you of your wounds. Oh, wait there, if their wounds are incur incurable, of course he's talking about us in the future his people who he brings back he needed this to play out through history he needed it to degrade to the point where it got to in order for a stiff-necked and rebellious people to realize their need for him to realize that it was him that they love that they want to hearken to and he says i will heal your wounds you yaakov you yisrael i will heal your wounds not those people though those people who suffered uh, the curses and were destroyed, he didn't heal them. He healed Yaakov, he healed Israel. Declares Yehovah, for they have called you an outcast, saying, This is Sion, no one is seeking her. Thus said Yehovah, See, I turn back the captivity of Yaakov's tents. That's how he cures Yaakov. That's how he heals their wound. And have compassion on his dwelling places. And this city shall be built upon its own mound. And the palace stand on its right place. And he will choose Jerusalem again as we saw earlier. And out of them shall arise thanksgiving. And the voice of those who are laughing. And I shall increase them and they shall not diminish. And I shall esteem them and they shall not be small. These are all the languages. This is all the language rather of the blessings and the curses that uh, we will see. As we go on in the third part, uh, I will make you the head and not the tail and all these things. So he's talking in the prophets here of them experiencing the curses. He says, look, your wounds are incurable. Go away into the nations. But I will turn back uh, your captivity. And whether or not the people understood it in that day to mean, well, we're going to be cast out, but, you know, in... Five years' time, we're all going to be going back to the land. I don't know. But that's not the time scale that he was talking on. Just like with the patriarchs when he says, look, I'm going to bring you into the land and you're going to have loads of descendants and this, that, and the other. You're going to possess the land. They were the promises that were given to them. And yet they were promises that were very far off. And they might be, might be promises that are very far off uh, for us as well. I'm certainly not convinced 
that uh, we're at the end of time. I think that we're living in quite a good period of time. History has been an incredibly evil period and as much evil as there is in the world today, in comparison to history, you go back to the Crusades or um, you know, the Inquisition rather, there was incredible evil that was done at the time and we're, we're really not living in a period of time which is worse than any other. And I'm aware that it could change at any moment, but that's true of any period in history before. So out of them shall arise thanksgiving, and the voice of those who are laughing, I shall increase them, they shall not diminish, and I shall esteem them, and they shall not be small. And his children shall be as before, and his congregation shall be established before me. And I shall punish all who oppress them. I'm going to bring the oppression on them, and then I'm going to punish the oppressors for doing the oppressing. And his prince shall be from him, and his ruler shall come from among him. And I shall bring him near, and he shall approach me. For who is this who has pledged his heart to approach me, declares Yehovah. And you shall be my people, and I shall be your Elohim, the fulfillment of all the things that we're seeing being spoken of in the Torah portion. Ezekiel 36, 22 to 32 says, Therefore say to the house of Yisrael, Thus said the master Yehovah, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Yisrael, but for my set-apart name's sake, which you have profaned among the Gentiles wherever you went. Okay, so we're supposed to be to him a name, a praise, an esteem. We're supposed to be a set-apart people to him. And he says, I'm going to do this for the sake of my name. And I shall set apart my great name, which has been profaned among the Gentiles, which you have profaned in their midst. And the Gentiles shall know that I am Yehovah, declares the Master Yehovah, when I am set apart in you before their eyes. And I've spoken before about what the meaning of the name Yehovah is. It's he who was, he who is, he who, he who is to come, basically. It speaks of him being outside of time. It's interesting to me that it says the Gentiles are going to know that I am he who was, who is, who is to come. When I set you apart, uh, when I'm set apart in you before their eyes. Okay, when these prophecies have come true, when they know that the Bible has been accurate and all of these things that they thought impossible have come true, then they will know that I am Yehovah. And I shall take you from among the Gentiles, and I shall gather you out of all lands, and I shall bring you into your own land. So these are the promises that when his people are amongst the Gentiles, that he's going to cleanse them and bring them back to the land. And that's what's happening to us right now. That's what's happened throughout history to people who have been cleansed by his word. It is the fulfillment of Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36 isn't one event that happens at the end of time. This is a process which is happening today. I shall sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols I cleanse you. That's happening to us right now. We know that this water that is sprinkled is the, uh, the water of purification of the red heifer sacrifice that Yeshua fulfilled. That he sprinkles our conscience. From all your filthiness and all your idols I cleanse you. And I shall give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I shall take the heart of stone out of your flesh. And I shall give you a heart of flesh. That's what he's done to us. He's doing all of this right now. This is a process which is occurring. And put my spirit within you. And I shall cause you to walk in my laws and cherish my justices and shall do them. Okay, once we've turned in repentance to him and we've chosen him, that's what he's done. He's taken that heart of stone that we had away and he's given us a heart of flesh that cherishes his commands. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. This is what's going to happen. These are promises that are made to us. You shall be my people and I shall be your Elohim. So when we're in the land, all of this 
will have been fulfilled. However, he's doing this right now. He's cleansing people's hearts. He's giving them a heart of flesh to cherish his commands. And I shall save you from all your uncleannesses. And I shall call for the grain and increase it. And I bring no scarcity of food upon you. These are the blessings. We are at the moment, we're in the time of Jacob's trouble. People read Jeremiah 30 uh, carefully. You'll see that Jacob's trouble is actually when uh, Yehudah and Yisrael are scattered among the nations. It's not something that happens at the end of time. It's been misunderstood to be that. But if you read it carefully, it's um, the captivity. That's the time of Jacob's trouble. And he says, I'll bring these blessings upon you when I bring you into the land. And I shall increase the fruit of your trees and the increase of your fields so that you need never again bear the reproach of scarcity of food among the Gentiles. And you shall remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good. And you shall loathe yourselves in your own eyes for your crookednesses and your abominations. And I don't know about you, but when I look back on my life before I knew Yehovah, this is certainly true of me today. I'm sure when we're in the land, we'll also look back and we'll loathe ourselves. But this is a process which is happening to his people now. Not for your sake am I acting, declares the Master Yehovah. Let it be known to you, be ashamed and blush for your ways, O house of Israel. Deuteronomy 27 verse 1 says, And Moshe with the elders of Israel commanded the people. And I've spoken before about the fact that Moshe had like maybe 12 million people to speak to. And he needed the Shoftim, the Shoterim, the elders of Israel, the heads of whatever numbers of people to speak with the people. He commanded the people saying, cherish all the commands which I am commanding you today. And it shall be on the day when you pass over the Yardin to the land which Yehovah your Elohim is giving you, that you shall set up for yourselves large stones and plaster them with plaster. Okay, so it says plaster here. Really what the word means is lime or whitewash. It's saying you shall whitewash the outside of these stones. And we kind of think of whitewash as a bad thing. It was bad when the uh, scribes, the Pharisees, the religious leaders would whitewash the outside, but the inside was corrupt. It was uh, like a whitewashed sepulcher inside full of dead men's bones, which would have defiled it. So we are absolutely to whitewash the outside of ourselves. We are to appear righteous before men, but we're not to do that as an appearance. We're to change the inside so that then the outside is changed so that the outside is whitewashed so that we do appear righteous but because we are righteous not because we're trying to appear to be righteous and write on them all the words of this Torah when you have passed over so you go into the land which Yehovah your Elohim is giving you a land flowing with milk and honey as Yehovah Elohim of your fathers has spoken to you and it shall be when you've passed over the Yardin that on Mount Eval you shall set up these stones which I command you today and you plaster them with plaster, okay, with the whitewash again. Build an altar to Yehovah your Elohim there, an altar of stones. Do not use an iron tool on them. We've been told this before. Exodus 20 verse 25 says, If you make me an altar of stone, do not build it of cut stone. For if you use a chisel on it, an iron tool, you've profaned it. Because the stones were to be natural stones. They were to be living stones, if you like. Like living waters. And to be natural flowing waters as opposed to dead water or stagnant water. So here these stones are to be the stones that they find. Stones that have been shaped according to the will of Yehovah and not according to the will of of man and that's what they're to build these altars out of the altars are to be stones that have been formed according to Yehovah's will and not according to the way that man would have it and they are to be outwardly righteous because they are inwardly righteous first Peter 2 verse 5 says you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house a set apart priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to Elohim through Yeshua Messiah and whenever we see an altar on the earth 
we should recognize that it has a correlate in heaven. There's something that it teaches us about the altar in heaven. There's also something that it teaches us about us as an altar of earth, if you like. Us as the temple of the Ruach to offer up spiritual sacrifices as living stones. Stones that should be formed according to Yehovah's will and not according to our will. Jeremiah 17 verse 1 says, The sin of Yehovah is written with a pen of iron. An iron tool is used on these stones, but it's the sin which is written on them, which is engraved upon their hearts, rather than um, Yehovah's Torah, which is to be uh, engraved on our hearts. Build the altar of Yehovah your Elohim with complete stones and you shall offer burnt offerings on it to Yehovah your Elohim. This word is Shalem, Shalem stone. It's not Tamim stones. It's Shalem, which is related to uh, Shalom. This is the word Shalem, complete, safe, peaceful, perfect, whole, full, at peace. Okay, again, not hewn stones, which have been formed according to man's will, but these complete stones, these stones, if you like, in a state of shalom, this is what it is to have shalom when you are complete, you're perfect, whole, you're full, you're at peace. That is what shalom is, and that's how these stones are to be, just as we are to be. Great shalom have those who love your Torah. And shall offer peace offerings and eat there and rejoice before Yehovah your Elohim. And you shall write all the words of the Torah on the stones plainly and well. And of course, as we saw in Ezekiel 36, the process which is happening with us, or has happened with us, is Yehovah has taken away that heart of stone and given us a heart of flesh so that the words of the Torah can be written on those stones. Just as Paul speaks in 2 uh, Corinthians 3, when he says, you know, when the law was written on tablets of stone, it was a ministration of death, as it was to these people. When they knew the law, but when it was written on a heart of stone, it brought death to them. They had to have that heart of stone removed and heart of flesh given to them. And that's not something that Yehovah does to us, just picking us up and saying, right, okay, you're stubborn, I'm going to take away your heart of stone, give you a heart of flesh. It's something that he's done to us over the play out of time throughout our lives. He's given us a heart of flesh to listen to his commands, to uh, write his commands on our hearts so that we love them and that we will do them. We have become those people that he was looking for, those people who actually proclaim to be his. And Moshe and the priests and the Levites spoke to all Israel, saying, Be silent and hear Shema, O Israel. This day you have become the people of Yehovah, your Elohim. This day, and you do these things, this day you have become the people of Yehovah, your Elohim. And you shall obey the voice of Yehovah, your Elohim, and do his commands and his laws, which I command you today. And all of these shalls, which are written throughout this, as we've seen in previous Torah portions, are haves. And you have obeyed the voice of Yehovah. This day you have become the people of Yehovah, your Elohim, and you have obeyed the voice of Yehovah, your Elohim, because he sees the future. He sees us now. He sees that he's redeemed us from the nations that he's taken us. He's sprinkled us with water. He's taken away our hearts of stone and given us hearts of flesh so that we will be his people. And Moshe commanded the people on that day saying, these are to stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people. When you've passed over the Yardin, Shimon and Levi and Yehuda and Yisachar and Yosef and Binyamin. And these are to stand on Mount Eval to curse Revain, Gad and Asher and Zebulun, Dan and Naphtali. And the Levites shall speak with a loud voice and shall say to all the men of Israel, Cursed is the man who makes a carved or molded image, an abomination to Yehovah, the work of the hands of the craftsmen, sets it up in secret, and all the people shall answer and say, Amen. So now we're going to see, well, he's going to give us the, uh, the curses 
in Deuteronomy 28. But here in Deuteronomy 27, we get what appears to be what are like the, the important ones to Yahuwah. So now we're going to see what things are particularly precious to Yahuwah because often the things that we think are going to be important are less important and he values things uh, more than others. We know that that's true because Yeshua says that you have omitted the weightier matters of the Torah. Cursed is he who makes light of his father or his mother and all the people shall say, Amen. So this is all the people agreeing to this. Okay, you're going to go into the land. You've got this chance. Go in, be Yehovah's people, claim to be his people, and all the people are there listening going, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Now they're all agreeing. You're going to be cursed if you do this, and they're all there saying, Amen, Amen. But they will not do it. Cursed is he who moves his neighbor's boundary, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who misleads the blind in the way, and all the people shall say, Amen. And of course, as Charlie looked at recently, these things have principles behind them. We can look at these things just on the surface of what they say and say these things only apply to this situation. But of course, they don't. He who misleads the blind in the way, he's cursed before Yehovah. I'm sure we can all appreciate what that means. Cursed is he who twists the justice of the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who lies with his father's wife, because he has uncovered his father's bed, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who lies with any beast, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who lies with his sister, the daughter of his father, or the daughter of his mother, and all the people shall say, Amen. Remember the law was added because of transgressions. Think about Abraham. Did Abraham do this? Cursed is he who lies with his mother-in-law, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who smites his neighbor secretly, and all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is he who takes a bribe to slay an innocent soul, and all the people shall say, Amen. And we should really take some time to look through this list. I'd recommend meditating on it. Make this your meditation in the Torah. What is it to take a bribe to slay an innocent soul, to advantage yourself while disadvantaging somebody else who is innocent? Yelba's going to look at that in exactly the same way. We're not going to be able to say, well, it wasn't a bribe. I didn't take a bribe. I, I didn't kill an innocent soul. But the principles are there. Cursed is he who does not establish the words of this Torah, and all the people shall say, Amen. We're in this place at the moment. Okay, I've spoken of the people of Israel of the past. They were deep into their wickedness. They didn't do any of the things that Yehovah asked. The very easy things for them to have done when he was so close to them. They didn't do those things. And so the period of history that we are living in at the moment, we are experiencing the consequences of their sin. Because they've sinned, we're not getting the curses. We're not being cursed in the same way. We've been redeemed from the curse of the law. But we are living with the consequences of them being cursed. And we need to distinguish those things. Whether someone is being cursed, uh, according to Deuteronomy 28, or whether it's simply the consequence of us living in this period of time where we're suffering the consequences of these curses. Leviticus 26, 3 to 13 says, if you walk in my laws and cherish my commands and shall do them, then I shall give you rain in its season and the land shall yield its crops and the trees of the field yield their fruit. And your threshing shall last till the time of the grape harvest and the grape harvest shall last till the time of sowing. And you shall eat your bread until you have enough and shall dwell in your land safely. Now these are the promises that are made to us. We've submitted ourselves to him. We're doing what he asks. We're proclaiming to be his people. And we're causing him to proclaim to be our Elohim. But this particular part of history, we are living it 
in the consequences of their sin. Okay, Elohim is distant from us. He is far from us. He has his face turned uh, away from us. As we get to Torah portion, Hazinu, we will understand uh, what is required for him to turn his face back to us. And he has promised that he will do this. He's spoken of this period of time when his people return to him and begin to do these things. But these promises are promises that are for us. And these things speak of our future. And I shall give peace in the land and you shall lie down and no one make you afraid. And I shall clear the land of evil beasts and not let the sword go through your land. And you shall pursue your enemies and they shall fall by the sword before you. And five of you shall pursue a hundred and a hundred of you pursue ten thousand. And your enemies shall fall by the sword before you. And I shall turn to you and make you bear fruit and shall increase you and shall establish my covenant with you when he turns his face back to us again. And you shall eat the old supply and clear out the old because of the new. The abundance that we have will be so much that all of that old store that we had, we won't need it. We won't have space for the new stuff because we'll be getting rid of the old. And I shall set my dwelling place in your midst and my soul shall not reject you. He has rejected you, shall I aim, but he will choose it again and we will dwell in the land and he will set his tabernacle in our midst. That's going to be Yeshua. Okay, Yeshua is the tabernacle of Yahuwah. He is Yahuwah made manifest in the flesh. And I shall walk in your midst and I shall be your Elohim and you shall be my people. Again, he's going to walk in our midst as Yeshua. Yeshua is going to be ruling and reigning. I am Yehovah your Elohim who brought you out of the land of Mitraim from being their slaves. And I have broken the bars of your yoke and made you walk upright. And you could say, well, that promise was kind of to them. He, he redeemed them from Mitraim. He'd broken the bars of their yoke, the oppression that was on them, and made them walk upright. Although they didn't really walk upright at the time, did they? This promise is to us. He's broken the bars of our yoke, our bondage to sin, and made us walk upright. His tabernacle will be in our midst. He will walk in our midst. Okay? He's going to be there as Yeshua to rule and reign with us. Even in this time of cursing, okay, we've got those promises for the future. And that will be when we dwell in the land. We must be careful not to appropriate for ourselves these blessings which are promised for when we're in the land for now. However, even in this time when we're living with the consequences of their sin, blessings do come. Blessed are the poor in spirit because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Even in the midst of all of this, in the midst of this corrupt world which is around us, we have these blessings. We have these promises that are given to us. These are the things that we should hold on to. Blessed are those who mourn because they shall be comforted. Okay? Again, I haven't transgressed the Torah when in mourning. I haven't run off to whatever my addiction is to have some of my addiction. Rather, I've reached the point where I have Yahuwah in the world. I've got all of this stuff going around me, going on around me, but I've got Yahuwah for my comfort. Blessed are the meek, because they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, because they are filled. And these things are true of us now, and amongst all of this, we are, we are blessed. All of the world around us, no matter what they think that they've got, they have nothing. But we know what we've got and we know what we're moving towards. Blessed are the compassionate because they shall obtain compassion. That's linked with being his people. I will make those who are not my people, I will make them my people. And he who has not obtained compassion, he shall obtain compassion. <coughs> Blessed are the clean in heart because they shall see Elohim. <coughs> Blessed are the peacemakers, because they shall be called sons of Elohim. 
Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they reproach and persecute you and falsely say every wicked word against you for my sake. In the midst of all of this corruption, all of this decay in the world, it really doesn't matter to us. We can hold on to the fact that we are blessed, that the world might look at us and think that we were cursed. They might look at us and think, well, what have they got going on in their lives? But truly we are blessed and they are cursed. Rejoice and be glad because your reward in the heavens is great. For in this way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. They would have looked at the prophets going about in the way that they did and thought, what is there for the, these men? What is it to obey Yehovah? Why would we obey the voice of Yehovah? And that's what people think of us today. But our reward is great in the heavens. And he, lifting up his eyes towards his disciples, said, Blessed are the poor, because yours is the kingdom of Elohim. Blessed are you who hunger now, because you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, because you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men shall hate you, and when they shall cut you off, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as wicked for the sake of the son of Adam. Not, you know, you're not blessed... <laughs> if uh, people cast out your name as wicked, if you are wicked, but if it's for the sake of Yeshua that they say these things about you, you are truly blessed. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for look, your reward is great in heaven, for that is how their fathers treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, because you are receiving your comfort. That is, these people who put their store in these things. Of course, as we've seen recently, Yehovah will bless people in these things it's not if you have any riches you are cursed but these people who live in the world to become rich those who labor to be rich they think that they're blessed they're blessing themselves yet they are um, are far from being blessed woe to you who have been filled because you shall hunger woe to you who are laughing now because you shall mourn and weep Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for thus their fathers did to the false prophets. But I say to you who are hearing, love your enemies, do good to those hating you, bless those cursing you, and pray for those insulting you. See beyond the situation that you have. See beyond that to the fact that you are blessed. And this is a great example of how we are to act differently to how Yehovah acts. He asks us to act differently because we are different to him. It's not because he's got different standards of righteousness. He says, bless those cursing you, whereas to, to them, he will curse them. But he is a being which is outside of time. He knows all. He is unlimited in his understanding. We are not. And for a being that is limited in its understanding, can only understand little bits of a situation, he says, look, leave it in my hands. Okay, you don't, don't be trying to understand all of this situation and work out this and that and how vengeance should be um, attributed. Rather do good to these people and leave what is right and what is just, what is justice in my hands. In life, we are truly blessed. We're in amongst this cursed world but we are truly blessed because for the world when they look out you know you've got the rich trying to labor to make themselves richer you've got people who are laboring under whatever delusions thinking this or that is good and they're going after this and that as if it's going to bring them some kind of satisfaction as if it will bring them shalom when actually all it is is a myriad of confusing paths none of which lead to anywhere that the people actually want to go. No matter how far along it they get, it does not lead to satisfaction. It always leads to some element of disappointment. It cannot lead to shalom, cannot lead to wholeness, because only his word can lead to those things. Only his word understands uh, all of the edifices that we see around us and we understand from a limited perspective. So the world is... Um, just a, a huge array of bewildering paths. And you can make great progress down a path, 
but if it's not leading the uh, not leading where you want to be then what's the point in making any progress whatsoever for us it is incredibly simple we have a path which is an incredibly well defined path it has fences on either side we are told do not go beyond this fence we might think what's beyond that fence is great we want to go after that but it's just one of those myriad dark paths that leads to something that promises something that can never bring shalom can never bring completeness wholeness and can never bring wellness but we have a path whose destination uh, we we understand we comprehend where it is that we're going we understand these promises that are given to us and some people will look at the path and they'll think well that's just not really very much is it they don't understand the path first peter 2 11 to 12 says beloved ones i appeal to you as sojourners and pilgrims so that's what we are we are amongst this um this world that is full of the curses of disobedience where sojourners and pilgrims there and peter says i I appeal to you to abstain from fleshly lusts which battle against your souls. Having your behavior among the Gentiles good so that when they speak against you as evildoers, let them by observing your good works esteem Elohim in a day of visitation. So he's speaking to those who are scattered, those who are among um, those who are experiencing Jacob's trouble. And he says, let by being among the Gentiles and doing these good things, be a name, be a praise, and be an esteem to Elohim. And let them, by observing your good works, esteem Elohim. Proverbs 4, verse 18 says, The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines ever brighter unto the perfect day. And again, it's impossible for these things to be hidden if these things are not this light, some will react well to the light and some will react badly to the light. But if these things are not that in our life, it's because we're not proclaiming to be Elohim's people. Probably we're keeping something back. We're not being fully submitted to him. I started the Torah portion with this picture. And it speaks so much Okay, we have these people here on the broad path which leads to destruction on the left. And they're attracted by the things of this world. They want the riches of this world. They want this, they want that. They want all of those myriad dark paths that lead to somewhere that they think that they know where it leads to, but it's actually ultimately just not satisfying. It's full of disappointment. And then you've got these people here on the right those who are walking the narrow way and they can't even see what they are walking towards. They know they've been promised that there's something just up there around that corner. They've been promised, they've been told what it is and they love what it is and they love the path that leads there. But they've not seen it. The people on the broad path which leads to destruction, they can see what it is that they think that they want and they're running headlong for it but it leads to destruction and this this speaks very much as to um, exactly what faith is. It's like if someone said to you, there's a million pounds just over that hill. You can either have that million pounds or you can have this 10 pounds. Those who believed them would go after the million pounds. Of course you would go after the million pounds. It's of so much more value. Those who did not believe, those who did not have faith of what was over the hill, they would take the 10 pounds and they would feel satisfied in the fact that they had that. Although ultimately it would be disappointing for them. I'll come back in the second part and we'll look at the, the blessings and curses as given in Deuteronomy 28. Okay, so Deuteronomy 28, we'll briefly go through some of the promises which are given to us, the blessings which we have promised to us if we take hold of them and act as Jehovah's people. 
and then we'll go through the curses as well. It shall be if you d diligently obey the voice of Yehovah your Elohim, cherishing doing all his commands which I command you today, the Yehovah your Elohim shall set you high above all nations of the earth. And not for our sake, the sake of his name, so that we will praise and esteem a name, a set apart people for Yehovah our Elohim. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of Yehovah your Elohim. Blessed are you in the city and blessed are you in the field. Blessed is the fruit of your body and the fruit of your ground, the fruit of your livestock, the increase of your cattle, the offspring of your flocks. Blessed is your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed are you when you come in and blessed are you when you go out. Yehovah causes your enemies who rise against you to be smitten before your face and they shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. Yehovah commands the blessing on you in your storehouses and in all you set your hand to and, you shall, and shall bless you in the land which Yehovah your Elohim is giving you. Yehovah does establish you as a set apart people to himself as he has sworn to you if you cherish the commands of Yehovah your Elohim and walk in his ways. So dead simple, you do that, you proclaim to be his people, he proclaims to be your Elohim, you shall be my people, I shall be your Elohim, is the promise. And all the peoples of the earth shall see that the name of Yehovah is called upon you, exactly what we were looking at before in Deuteronomy 4, and they shall be afraid of you. And Yehovah shall make you to have plenty of what is good in the fruit of your body, in the fruit of your livestock, and in the fruit of your ground, and in the land of which Yehovah swore to your fathers to give you. Yehovah opens to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give rain to your land in its season, and to bless all the work of your hand. And you shall lend to many nations, but you do not borrow. And Yehovah shall make you the head and not the tail, and you shall be only on top and not be beneath if you obey the commands of Yehovah your Elohim, which I command you today to cherish and do. And do not turn aside from any of the words which I am commanding you today, right or left, to go after other gods to serve them. Hebrews 11, 8 to 10, speaks of the attitude that we're to have. By belief, Abraham obeyed. Okay, even if we just leave it at that, by belief, Abraham obeyed. When he was called to go out to a place which he was about to receive as an inheritance, we have a place which we're about to receive as an inheritance. Might not be in our lifetimes, but we are promised that we will receive this inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. We actually know where we're going. Okay, Abraham had promises from Elohim just as we have promises from Elohim. And he just obeyed, he just went out. And that's the response that we're to have as well. By belief he sojourned in the land of promise as a stranger, dwelling in tents with Yitzhak and Yaakov, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking for a city, having foundations whose builder and maker is Elohim. It's like the ones on the narrow path can't see exactly what it is that they're heading towards. They just know that it is promised by Elohim, and that is enough. This picture really does speak to me. It speaks, it speaks of so much of the scriptures. This was a, a picture that I got off uh, goodsalt.com. I think it's .com. And the people on the left are are a lord and they're they're flocking in their droves and they it kind of you know, it reminds me of what it's actually like to be out in the world to see the people who are kind of like just mindlessly going around or just being drawn to things that are, are obviously bad and cannot possibly lead to anything good and you just think it's so sad that they're blind to these things it's so sad that when we look at them with the eyes which Yehovah has given us, we can see them for what they are, that they're just tat and that they're worthless. And the people on the right who have the promises of what is to come, and they truly have eyes to see. 
Galatians 3, 10 to 14, something that we need to bear in mind as we go on now. That's the promise. That's what we have. That's why we're to walk on the narrow path. We know where we're going. We know what's promised. We're to head out. By faith we obey. We go after those things and we'll make it if we do. But now we're going to go on to the curses in the Torah. Verse 10 says, And as many as are of works of Torah are under the curse. For it has been written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all that has been written in the book of the Torah to do them. And we need to remember who it is that Paul's writing to. He's writing to the Galatians who have all moved away from Messiah and said all that we need now is to follow the Torah. Paul says if that was true and all you had was the Torah, then you would all be under the curse of the Torah. If that's it, you know, you've got the Torah and that's where your righteousness is going to come from. Not that you can't be righteous by following the Torah, just that if that's going to be your sole source of righteousness, if you've strayed from that, you're under the curse. Because cursed is everyone who does not continue in all that is written in the book of the Torah. Unless you've done it all, you're under the curse. The only way that you can get out from under that curse is to have faith in Mashiach to redeem you. Verse 11 says, And that no one is declared right by Torah before Elohim is clear, for the righteous shall live by belief. So Paul's going to introduce a dichotomy here. No one is declared right by the Torah before Elohim. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of Elohim. If the Torah is all you've got, then you're going to be under the curse. The righteous shall live by belief. Verse 12 says, And the Torah is not of belief, but the man who does them shall live by them. Okay, so he introduces this dichotomy. You can do the Torah and it not be of belief. That's the problem that he says that Israel had. They went after the Torah, but it wasn't of belief. The Gentiles, they followed by belief and they obtained to the Torah of righteousness. The Torah in and of itself isn't of belief. You can follow it by belief, but in and of itself, it's not of belief. But the man who does them shall live by them. So here we've got these two things. And how do we bring them into harmony with one another? Okay, no one's right before Elohim by the Torah. The righteous live by belief. Torah is not of belief. The man who does them shall live by them. How do we mesh all of those things together? Verse 12 says, Messiah redeemed us from the curse of the Torah, having become a curse for us. For it has been written, cursed is everyone who hangs upon a tree. And as we saw, that is what they had to do when somebody was given the death penalty, so that as the land was not defiled, so that they were accounted the cursed before Elohim, they were hung on a tree as Yeshua was. In order that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the nations in Messiah Yeshua. So he's explaining to these people, you who wish to be under the Torah, do you not hear the Torah? Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all that is written in the book of the Torah. If you've not continued in it all, you're under the curse. You need Messiah. You can't walk away from Messiah now. Without Messiah, you're under the curse. Messiah is the one who redeemed you from the curse of the Torah. So we need to understand this as we go on. Because we're going to read about the curses in the Torah. People can be, become very confused at what is written as a curse in the Torah. Is that something which is over us in our life now? We can't um, repent. We can't uh, repent of that sin and then not be under the curse through Messiah? Is it that when we sin, those curses will come upon us? Or are we living in a period now where because of their disobedience, we live with the consequences of their disobedience. Deuteronomy 29, 18-19 says, Lest there should be among you a man or a woman, or clan or tribe, whose heart turns away from Yehovah or Elohim, to go and serve the gods of these nations, lest there should be among you a root bearing bitterness 
or wormwood. And it shall be when he hears the words of this curse that he should bless himself in his heart, saying, I have peace though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart. So this is Deuteronomy 29. It follows the curse that we're about to read in uh, Deuteronomy 28. Notice it calls it here the words of this curse. So when Paul says the curse of the Torah, he is using terms from Scripture. He's talking about Deuteronomy 28 as this curse or the curse, the same same exact uh, words in Hebrew. And it shall be if you do not obey the voice of Yehovah your Elohim to cherish doing all his commands and his laws which I command you today that all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. So let's remember what these things are and what they were in the lives of these people. When they were dwelling in the land, they were either blessed because of their obedience or because of the obedience of the nation of Israel, these curses came upon them until eventually they were ejected from the land. Just as we don't look to the blessings and appropriate them to ourselves for right now, we do not do so with the curse that we're about to read either because we have been redeemed from the curse of the Torah. That's not to say that Yehovah cannot chastise somebody for disobedience and the bad consequences will not come in your life because of disobedience. I'm talking specifically about this curse that we have been redeemed from. Cursed are you in the city and cursed are you in the field. Cursed is your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed is the fruit of your body and the fruit of your land, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. Cursed are you when you come in and cursed are you when you go out. So this is the opposite for them. When they're there as his people in the land, these things gradually overtook them and gradually they were cursed and cast out of the land. They were not prosperous there. Yehovah sends on you the curse, the confusion, and the rebuke in all that you set your hand to until you are destroyed and until you perish quickly because of the evil of your doings by which you have forsaken me. Yehovah makes the plague cling to you until he has consumed you from the land which you are going to possess. Yehovah smites you with wasting disease and with inflammation and with burning and with extreme heat and with the sword, and with blight, and with mildew, and they shall pursue you until you perish. Now this is a very important point. It's something that's relevant to me in my life, but something that I feel I should explain to people. When you see disease, inflammation, okay, these things, the blight, okay, are these curses which come upon us because of disobedience? I, at the moment, have a disease. Has that come upon me because of disobedience? I think it's very important when in our lives things like that happen that we examine ourselves with very careful scrutiny to see if that is the case because, as I say, he can chastise people for disobedience and we should examine ourselves. But we should not jump and say, well, this person has been cursed because these are one of the curses. We see in the Torah community, we see cases of cancer. We see cases of disease. So this is an important question to address. Have these things come upon these people as a a consequence of some kind of disobedience? Well, as I say, what this is talking about is those people having all of these things come upon them when they're in the land so that they're not blessed in the land and all of the people are suffering from all of these things and then he brings enemies upon them things get worse and worse until they're cast out rather what we are experiencing is something that we'll look at as we get to the end of Deuteronomy 28 that the protection from these diseases was taken from Yehovah's people and he turned his face from them we are now When we're amongst the Gentiles, we are suffering the consequences of their sin, the consequences of them being cursed in this way. It is not uh, necessarily anyway a result of disobedience that somebody is particularly cursed in a particular way. Deuteronomy 28, 23 says, 
and your heavens which are over your head shall be bronze and the earth which is under you iron okay so you will not receive um, rain from the heavens and the earth in which you put your crops will be hard to dig Yehovah makes the rain of your land powder and dust from the heavens it comes down on you until you are destroyed okay so Yehovah says look this land is not like the land of Egypt this land in order for it to get rain the rain comes from me and we see this in the millennium when the nations will not go up to observe the feast of Sukkot he withholds the rain from off their lands so he says you know you'll be blessed in the land if you obey me however I will not increase all of these things for you the heavens will not yield rain and you will find it difficult to plant these crops Yehovah causes you to be defeated before your enemies you go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them and you shall become a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth and your carcasses shall be food for all the birds of the heavens and the beasts of the earth with no one to frighten them away. Yehovah shall smite you with the boils of Mitzrayim, with tumors, with the scab, with the itch from which you are unable to be healed. Again, if we see someone with a tumor, with cancer, do we say, well, you're suffering the curses of Deuteronomy 28? No, this was... When you're in the land, if you're disobeying me, if you're my people and you're not doing the things, you will have these things come upon the populations until you're destroyed, until you're driven out of the land. Yehovah shall smite you with madness and blindness and bewilderment of heart. And you shall be groping at noon as a blind man gropes in darkness and not prosper in your ways. And you shall be only oppressed and plundered all the days with no one to save you. So we can see the context of these things. You become engaged to a wife, but another man does lie with her. You build a house, but do not dwell in it. You plant a vineyard, but do not use its fruit. Your ox is slaughtered before your eyes, but you do not eat of it. Your donkey is violently taken from before you, and it is not given back to you. Your sheep are given to your enemies with no one to save them. Your sons and your daughters are given to another people, and your eyes look and fail for them all day long. Your hand powerless. A people whom you have not known eat the fruit of your land and all your labors, and you shall be only oppressed and crushed all the days. And one of the amazing things that struck me as I was reading through this is these are the curses that will come upon the people. But these things came upon Yehovah. These are the things that he had to behold. He became to engage to a wife, but another man lay with her. He built a house, but did not dwell in it. He planted the vineyard, but did not use their fruit. His sheep were given to his enemies with no one to save them. Their wound was incurable. His sons and daughters were given to another people as we are now dwelling in the land of the Gentiles. Your hand powerless. There is nothing more that Yehovah could have done when he beheld these people. A people whom you have not known eat the fruit of your land and all your labors. And that also is certainly true of Yehovah. It's what I was talking about before when I said he sees his people as he's outside of time. He's not cursed himself here. His people brought these consequences on him, but he knows what the future is. He knows that he will have a name and an esteem and a praise and a people set apart for himself. And that's what he was doing during this entire process. Yes, he had to look on these things and see them. The people, his people, had to look upon these things and see them, but they are temporal, okay? They are within time. They are mortal. The people who had these curses come upon them they died and the people in the future who he still speaks to as you are Yaakov, you are Jacob, you are Israel, you are Yisrael, they will see these things come upon them. You are willing, we will see these things come upon us. 
So Yehovah is not cursing himself here, although he did see these things on his way to the blessing. His people saw these things on the way to the blessing, but for the limited temporal people who are within time, some suffered the curses and they were cursed and they died. The people that it was all heading towards, Yah willing us, will see the blessings. But it's amazing to me that when Yehovah proclaimed these things to these people, he knew that he was going to see these things. Isaiah 5, 1 to 7 says, Please let me sing to the one I love, a song for my loved one regarding his vineyard. My loved one has a vineyard on a fertile hill. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vine and built a watchtower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. And he waited for the yielding of grapes, but it yielded rotten ones. And now, O inhabitant of Yerushalayim, a man of Yehuda, please judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why, when I waited for the yielding of, of grapes, did it yield rotten ones? What more could he have done? His hand was powerless. Their wound was incurable. There were no healing medicines for them. But for us, through this process, he has raised us up to be his people, to inherit those blessings, to take the land as an inheritance. He has brought healing to us. And now, please let me inform you of what I am doing to my vineyard, to take away its hedge and it shall be burned, to break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. It shall experience the curses. But that's not going to be the end of the vineyard. Okay, The vineyard ends in blessing and that was his, his purpose all along. And I lay it waste and it is not pruned or dug and thorn bushes and weeds shall come up and I command the clouds not to rain on it. Again, all of these things we read of in the curses. For the vineyard of Yehovah Zebaot is the house of Israel, and the man of Yehuda is his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but see oppression. Uh, for righteousness, but see weeping. And you shall be maddened because of the sight which your eyes see. Yehovah smites you in the knees and on the legs with evil boils which you are unable to be healed. And from the sole of your foot, to the top of your head. So again, we don't look at anybody who's got a dodgy leg or a dodgy knee um, <laughs> or boils and say, you're cursed of Yehovah. These curses are, are a very different thing. These are what are brought upon his people in disobedience so that they're cast out of the land before we are brought back. We are redeemed from this curse, although we are suffering the consequences of those people being cursed. Yehovah brings, on, brings you and the king whom you set over you to a nation which neither you nor your fathers have known. And there you shall serve all the gods, wood and stone. Thus you shall become an astonishment, a proverb and a mockery among all the peoples to which Yehovah drives you. So instead of a name, an esteem, a praise, a set apart people to Yehovah, we became an astonishment, a proverb and a mockery. And that's what happened to these people, okay? When they were cast out of the land, say, into the land of Assyria, this is what they were, okay? The people of Yehovah, and they brought shame upon his name. And we must be careful to not continue that cycle. You take much seed out into the field, but gather little in, for the locust consumes it. You plant vineyards and shall labor, but you need the drink of the wine, nor gather for the worm eats it. You have olive trees in all your border, but do not anoint with oil, for your olives drop off. You bring forth sons and daughters, but they are not with you, for they go into captivity. And this is certainly true of Yehovah again. Not that he's cursing himself. He knows he's on his way to the blessing at the end. But he... Uh, scattered much seed and gathered little in. Few there are that find uh, the narrow way which leads to life. He planted vineyards and he labored, but he did not drink of the wine uh, or gather him from it, the worm ate of it. He had the olive trees, 
He did not gather in his olives that were on the olive trees, dropped off, they were dead. And he brought forth sons and daughters, but they are not with him at this moment. They go into captivity, which is exactly what happened uh, to his people. Locusts possess all your trees and the fruit of your ground. The sojourner who is among you rises higher and higher above you, but you come down lower and lower. He lends to you, but you do not lend to him. He is the head and you are the tail. And again, we can't say, oh, I've, I've borrowed some money or this person has had money lent to them. Therefore, they're under the curses of Yehovah. No, again, these are the consequences of their sin, of us being among the nations. They lend to us now. We borrow from them. Well, that might be the case, but it doesn't mean that we um, are under the curse directly. It means that we are suffering the consequences of their disobedience. And all these curses shall come upon you and they shall pursue and overtake you until you are destroyed because you did not obey the voice of Yehovah your Elohim to cherish his commands and his laws which he commanded you. And they shall be upon you for a sign and for a wonder and on your seed forever. Because you did not serve Yehovah your Elohim with joy and gladness of heart for all the plenty. That's certainly something that we can learn from. Okay, We can take the principle from that, can't we? We can say, well, perhaps we should be serving Elohim with joy and gladness of heart. That's what he desires, even if these curses were... Uh, things that we are redeemed from. You shall serve your enemies whom Yehovah sends against you in hunger and in thirst and in nakedness and in need of all. And he shall put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. Yehovah brings a nation against you from afar, from the ends of the earth as swift as the eagle flies, a nation whose language you shall not understand. What struck me as I was, um, as I was reading through this is just how intimately Yehovah understands us. You know, if these were the writings of a man, you know, you, you could write all these grandiose things that were gonna happen to these people and how terrible it was gonna be and this and that's gonna happen. But Yehovah even recognizes things like a nation whose language you shall not understand. They're gonna come into your land and they're gonna take the fruit of your labor from you and you're not even going to understand their language. You're not going to understand what it's going to, what, what it's going to, what they're going to be saying. I heard someone say once that um, it's a, a terrifying thing, or it's a, a disconcerting thing, at least, when people whose languages you don't speak are laughing around you because you don't know what they're laughing at. And if you can just imagine yourself in that position, where all of these terrible things have come upon the country. All of these invaders have come in and not only that, but you can't understand them and they're all there laughing and you're terrified in your, your little family groups. Verse 50 says, A fierce looking nation which shows no regard for the elderly nor show favor to the young. And they shall eat the fruit of your livestock and the fruit of your land until you are destroyed and they leave you no grain, nor new wine, nor oil, nor the increase of your cattle or the offspring of your flocks until they have destroyed you. And these things just keep on getting worse and worse. Well, Yehovah recognizes they don't even show regard to the elderly. They don't show favor to the young. These are a people who are to be alien to you. You're not going to understand the language and they're going to be there eating of your abundance. And they shall besiege you at, at all your gates till your high and fence walls in which you are trusting come down in all your land. Because this is the problem that he's identified with these people. That they're going to be trusting in things like the walls that they've built, the horses that they've got from Mitraim, the riches which they've gathered for themselves. Again, these people who are blessing themselves, even though they're walking in disobedience, not realizing that all of those things that they're gathering to themselves are worth nothing if Yehovah's hand is against them. And they shall besiege you at all your gates in all your land, which Yehovah your Elohim has given you. And you shall eat the fruit of your own body, 
the flesh of your sons and your daughters whom Yehovah your Elohim has given you in the siege and distress in which your enemies distress you. I find this particular part of the curse very interesting. Obviously it's horrific that he says that you're going to be eating um, the fruit of your own body, your children. You're going to be eating them in the siege. And of course we see that happening in the scriptures. But this is a people who are in disobedience to Yahweh. There are people in whom there is wickedness. And so for all of the niceties and for all of the uh, their appearing nice to other people, because they're wicked in their hearts, he says uh, some pretty stark things against them. He says, the man among you who is tender and who is very delicate, his eye is evil against his brother, against the wife of his bosom, and against the rest of his children whom he leaves behind, against giving any of them the flesh of his children that he eats, because it is all that he is, all that has been left to him in the siege and distress with which your enemy distresses you in all your gates. The tender and the delicate woman among you who have not tried to set the sole of her foot on the ground because of her delicateness and tenderness. Her eye is evil against the husband of her bosom and against her son and against her daughter and against her seed which comes out from between her feet and her children whom she bears for she eats them in secret for lack of all in the siege and distress with which your enemy distresses you in all your gates. So even those people, the, the nice people among them, when the chips are down, because they're wicked, they're not submitted to Elohim, these are the people that they are. This is what is in their hearts. Times are good, you don't get it coming out of their hearts. When times are bad, you see who these people are. Just like the serpent in the garden. If Yehovah had just created paradise for man and had not put any kind of enticement in it, to allow man to step outside of, you know, everything's great, I may as well just obey, I may as well just do good because things are good. If he hadn't put the tree there and he hadn't given them the opportunity to sin, he would have never seen that that is what was in their hearts to do. It's only when we have an agitator, it's only when we have um, an enemy, it's only when we have Hasatan there to tempt us with something or rather to allow us to be tempted by showing us something to see whether it's in our hearts to go after that that we see who uh, those people actually are we see who we are when the temptation is there and this is who these people are even the delicate and the tender woman this is who she shows herself to be if you do not cherish doing all the words of this Torah that are written in this book to fear this esteemed and awesome name, Yehovah, your Elohim. Then Yehovah shall bring upon you and your descendants extraordinary plagues, great and lasting plagues and grievous and lasting sicknesses. And he shall bring back on you all the diseases of Mitzrayim of which you were afraid and they shall cling to you. And this is why we see disease. This is why we see cancer in his people as they're scattered among the Gentiles. Now, as a result of their disobedience, this curse was brought upon them. His protection, when he says, I will remove from you all of the diseases of Egypt, that is taken away. And now we are vulnerable among the Gentiles. Also, every sickness and every plague which is not written in the book of this Torah, Yehovah does bring upon you until you are destroyed. And you shall be left with few men, although you have become as numerous as the stars of the heavens, because you did not obey the voice of Yehovah your Elohim. And it shall be that as Yehovah rejoiced over you to do you good and increase you, so Yehovah does rejoice over you to destroy you and lay you waste, and you shall be plucked from off the land which you go to possess. And Yehovah shall scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other, and there you shall serve other gods which neither you nor your fathers have known wood and stone. And among those nations you are to find no rest, nor have a resting place for the sole of your foot. But there Yehovah shall give you a trembling heart, failing eyes, and sorrow of soul. 
and I've read this verse recently when I was talking about uh, the illness that I have and I said I am not afraid and that was not I can imagine afterwards, I thought I can imagine the people would have taken that as Yehovah has put you there to be afraid and you're saying, I am not afraid. But it goes back to what I was saying before. Even in this state where we are living with the consequences of their sin, the blessings are promised to us that we're blessed when we're persecuted. I have trust in Yehovah. I know what the future is. I know that I walk in righteousness before him. So I am not afraid. This is a curse which was to be on these people. I'm certainly not standing in defiance of this curse, but I know that I have a promised future and that is what I'm looking towards. And your life shall be hanging in suspense before you and you shall fear day and night and shall not be certain of your life. In the morning you say, Oh, that it were evening. And at the evening you say, Oh, that it were morning because of the fear of your heart with which you fear and because of the sight which your eyes see. And his people were carried off into Assyria with fish hooks in their mouths. And this is what it would have been like for them, for them to have been dwelling in the land, for them to have had abundance, for them to have built high walls and to gather horses and riches around themselves. And to think that they were safe in their disobedience only for these enemies to come and strip it all away from them and for them to have nothing. And Yehovah shall bring you back to Mitraim in ships by a way of which I said to you, you are never to see it again and there, shall, there you shall be sold to your enemies and ma as male and female slaves but no one to buy. Isaiah 43, 1-8, however, speaks to us speaks to us in our captivity, speaks to us as his chosen, as Yaakov. And again, it's what I was, uh, the sentiment that I was expressing when I said, I am not afraid. He says, Yisrael, do not fear for I have redeemed you. We've been redeemed from the curse of the Torah. I have called you by your name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I am with you, and through rivers, they do not overflow you. When you walk through fire, you are not scorched, and a flame does not burn you. For I am Yehovah, your Elohim, the set-apart one of Israel, your Savior. I gave Mitzrayim for your ransom, Cush and Savah in your place. Okay, he's brought us to him through this play out of history. Through all of these kingdoms which have risen and fallen, through the deaths of many, many, many men on the earth. That is how he has brought us to himself. Since you were precious in my eyes, you have been esteemed and I have loved you. And I, gave, I give men in your place and peoples for your life. Do not fear for I am with you. I shall bring your seed from the east and gather you from the west. These are his words to us as we're in the dispersion. As these curses that we have read have come upon his people and they have been scattered amongst the nations. He says, do not fear for I am with you. I shall bring your seed from the east and gather you from the west. I shall say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Okay, spoke of his sons and daughters going into captivity or spoke in the curses of their sons and daughters being taken into captivity. And we saw that that is something that was true of himself as well. But he knew that this was the end. Verse 7 says, All those who are called by my name, whom I have created, formed, even made for my esteem, as a praise, a name, and esteem for him. He shall bring out a blind people who have eyes and deaf ones who have ears. Those who could not see and yet could see. Those who could not hear and yet could hear his words. They're the ones who will bring back. They're the ones who will inherit the blessings even through this time of the consequences of the curse. First Peter 2, 9 to 10 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a set apart nation, a people for a possession. That's what he wanted. He wanted the name. He wanted an esteem. He wanted the set apart people for himself to be a praise unto him. 
that you should proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now the people of Elohim, who had not obtained compassion, but now obtain compassion, those to whom the blessings will be the promises, the inheritance that we will receive. Isaiah 60, remember that we, okay, we were called out of darkness into his marvelous night, light to proclaim his praises. This is the result that that will have on the people of the world. Arise, shine, for your light has come and the esteem of Yahuwah has risen upon you. For look, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness the peoples. But Yehovah arises over you and his esteem is seen upon you. He's called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. And the Gentile shall come to your light and the kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see all of them have gathered. They have come to you. Your sons come from afar and your daughters are supported on the side then you shall see and be bright and your heart shall throb and swell for the wealth of the sea is turned to you. The riches of the Gentiles come to you. A stream of camels cover your land. The dromedaries of Midian and Apha, all those from Shiva come bearing gold and incense and proclaiming the praises of Yehovah. He's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light that we should proclaim his praises. And now his, right, his light having risen upon us the gentiles shall see that light in the millennium we will receive the blessings as they're spoken of here and they will come proclaiming his praises also all the flocks of kedar are gathered to you the rams of nevioth to serve you they come up for acceptance on my altar and i embellish my esteemed house again the house for his name to dwell in he will again choose jerusalem in that time Zechariah uh, 2, 10 to 13 says, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Sion. For look, I am coming, and I shall dwell in your midst, declares Yehovah. Many Gentiles shall be joined to Yehovah in that day when his light has risen upon us. We're called out of darkness into his marvelous light to proclaim his praises. They will see that light. They will come, and they will proclaim his praises as well. They shall become my people and I shall dwell in your midst, and you shall know that Yehovah Zebaot has sent me to you. And Yehovah shall inherit Yehudah, his portion in the set-apart land, and he shall again choose Yerushalayim. Hush all flesh before Yehovah, for he has roused himself out of his set-apart dwelling. Isaiah 62, 1-4 says, For Sion's sake, Zion's sake, I am not silent, and for Yerushalayim's sake, I do not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her deliverance as a lamp that burns. And the nations shall see your righteousness and all kings your esteem, and you shall be called by a new name which the mouth of Yehovah designates. And you shall be a crown of comeliness in the hand of Yehovah and a royal headdress in the hand of your Elohim. No longer are you called forsaken and no longer is your land called deserted, but you shall be called Chepzibah uh, and your land married, for Yehovah shall delight in you and your land be married. That's what happens when he calls to us, when he allows us and he speaks to our hearts and we can choose to proclaim to be his people and we can choose to make him proclaim to be our Elohim. That is the invitation which is given to all of us. We're mid history now. We're in the consequences of the curse. We can be called back to the land. All we need to do is to be his people. All we need to do is to make him our Elohim. These are the words of the covenant which Yehovah commanded Moshe to make with the children of Israel and the land of Moab, besides the covenant which he made with them in Chorev. And Moshe called all Israel and said to them, You yourselves saw all that Yehovah did before your eyes in the land of Mitraim, to Pharaoh and to all his servants, to all his land. 
Your eyes saw the great trials, the signs, and those great wonders. But Yehovah has not given you a heart to know, and eyes to see, and ears to hear till this day. He hadn't given them to that people, but he has given them to us so that we can see what it is, so that we can enter into the land and take hold of those things which were promised to them and that are promised to us. And I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your garments have not worn out on you and your sandals have not worn out on your feet. You ate no bread and drank no wine nor strong drink so that you might know that I am Yehovah, your Elohim. And when you came to this place, Sihon, king of Heshbon, and O king of Bashan came out against us to battle and we smote them and took their land and gave it as an inheritance to the Reuvenites and to the Gadites and to the half-tribe of Manasseh. Therefore you shall cherish the words of this covenant and do them so that you prosper in all that you do. And we can take these words again and understand them in our own lives, how he has led us, however long he has led us for, okay? His provision, the things that we have in our life so that we know that he is Yehovah. When we've come against things that we need to overcome, be it sin or whatever it is that we've needed to overcome in order to walk in those promises, he has given us the deliverance. He's given us the victory in those things and therefore we shall cherish to do the words of the covenant so that we can prosper in all that we can do. Again, there is a broad way that leads to destruction and there's a narrow way which leads to life. And only those who understand faith, only those who understand what has been promised to them and that they really, you're leaving nothing behind in this world. What is just round the corner is worth walking that narrow path. The way may well be hard pressed. You may well be rejected by people. They may well speak evil of you for the sake of Messiah. But in that, you are blessed. You are redeemed from the curse of the Torah and you're walking towards the blessings. I'll finish in prayer. Father I pray that you grant it to us that we would walk into the kingdom that we would be able to fulfill the things that you ask in your word that we would be able to come into the land and present the first fruits of it to the man who is priest in those days I pray that we make it, Father. I pray that you'd help us. Help us to see anything in our lives that is displeasing to you. We want to please you, Father. Help us to see the broad way for what it is. Help us to see the narrow path. Make your promises clear to your people this week, Father, so that they can, they can understand I ask you to to heal the blind, to open their eyes. I ask you that you would be a healing to us. I ask you that you would pluck people from out of the world and be a cleansing to them. I thank you for all your people who love you. I thank you that you have retained the remnant like in the days of Elijah. Thank you for everything that you do, Father, and thank you for your word. Amen.